Well, thank you all for staying late. It's a bit of an oxymoron to ask someone who works from the government to talk about cost effectiveness. <laughs> but we'll give it a shot. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is, in terms of atherosclerosis imaging, some concepts of what's it going to take and whose responsibility is it. I'm not going to send you out with a number. This is the cost effectiveness of calcium scanning. Because as Leslie mentioned, there's so many assumptions. And your assumptions are not my assumptions, are not his assumptions. And since it's very assumption-based, the numbers you get are, have a somewhat air of artificiality about them. Certainly the leverage point is that in terms of calcium screening, uh, the risk of, certain, of heart disease, certainly in coronary, developing coronary disease, is certainly increased if calcium is present. And the potential does exist to, ca to capture risk that's misclassified by heart disease risk factors. The cost of screening, though, for subclinical atherosclerosis to identify risk is really poorly understood. And so what factors will influence the cost effectiveness? I think this is a necessary but rigorous standard for a diagnostic test. We tend to think about cost effectiveness from the standpoint of therapies. But we, what we have to view then is cardiovascular prevention as a continuum. It starts, as we've heard so many talks tonight, about screening to detect. But it moves on from there and leads must lead to treatment that's adhered to that prevents outcomes. And what we're all talking about here tonight is right here, screening for detection. But where we're all very responsible is on this second line. As another principle, anatomic screening has to be additive to risk factor screening. That is, the comparison has to be between multivariate modeled risk such as with the framing risk score versus that plus some anatomic tests. In this instance, we'll talk about EBCT. And I think, as Leslie mentioned, its weakness is that it talks only about mortality uh, and adjusted for quality, but it is what society asks for, and that is the quality adjusted life years saved. So what are the modeling considerations? What do we have to be cognizant of if we're going to think about using any test, the test that you're interested in, in a cost-effective way. First of all, it begins, what's the, what's the population in which it's applied? What's the risk of that population? As Leslie mentioned, cost-effectiveness in a low-risk population will not be as high as, as, as favorable as in a higher-risk population. The second is the aspects of the test itself. What's the incremental value of that test for risk prediction? And what's its actual financial cost, its, induced, its, its actual cost? And then there's a the concept of induced testing and incidental findings. Induced testing, tests that follow on as a consequence of the first test. Fourthly, what additional medications are used and what's their cost and what's their efficacy? Lastly, there's a concept of utility. And utility is a really important concept when we think of quality adjusted life you're safe. Utility is if you've got arthritis, what's the value of every day compared to someone for you compared to compared if you didn't have arthritis. Think about that for a minute. The burden of a diagnosis on a daily basis is measurable. And in fact, a study called the Beaver Dam, Beaver Dam Study measured this in a screening population and asked people, what's life like for you with your diagnoses, various diagnoses that were prevalent in the population. And in fact, for most symptomatic diagnoses, it was below 90%. Life was nine, less than 90% as good as if they didn't have the diagnosis and, and using time trade-off time trade methods. For, even for an asymptomatic diagnosis like hypertension, where it engenders medications, visits, and so forth, quality of life is degraded. And so as we label people with subclinical diagnoses, we've got to think about the effect on the utility of life. And quite frankly, we don't know. No one has ever studied the utility of a year of life with a subclinical atherosclerosis diagnosis. It's something we don't know of. For hypertension, though, it's 94%. A 6% decrement in quality of life, and we'll come back to that. And so if you think about these variables and you sequentially model them, this is a model that Pat O'Malley and our group put together. And basically, you start with screening, and you either do it risk factor screening alone, or you add an anatomic test. 
And this just shows one sequence of nodes through what gets to be a very complicated sequential model. But then you identify people as what their risk is, what the incremental risk shift is. There might be some induced testing. Some medications might ensue. There might be incidental findings from the scan. And then you've got a model in the effectiveness of the medicines and so forth. And what you wind up with is a number. That number is based very highly on assumptions and variables that you input. In a model I'm going to describe to you that's impressed, we made a variety of assumptions. First is that there would be increased identification using EBCT of individuals at risk, and that shift would be to approximately fourfold increase. That is, there'd be an incremental fourfold increase in risk in, in the identification of at risk individuals using calcium scanning. And that it would occur at modest costs, around four hundred dollars per patient. This is we took costs and model costs from the perspective of the payer not society. Uh, this is a, a common way to do this, the payer who would be paying for the test. And then look at induced costs, assuming as a base case that medicines would cost on average $300 a year and there would be some incidental findings that would engender costs. In at-risk individuals, an at-risk individual is someone who was identified as being at greater risk on the basis of the anatomic screening than by the risk factor screening we propose there would be some modest increase in subsequent cardiovascular testing or induced testing, such as stress testing, in about a third of those individuals, perhaps. That there would be a substantial increase in use of preventative therapies, like we'd all hope, perhaps from 10% in the people not at risk to up to upwards of three-quarters of the population would be treated appropriately with risk-reducing medications. And that there would only be a minor decrement in utility, down to about 98%. Now, remember, hypertension is 94%. So we felt those were fairly favorable assumptions to take as a base case. Other assumptions include life expectancy. When you diagnose someone at age 40, anything you do is going to last for life expectancy, or you would hope is going to have an effect across life expectancy. This is the problem screening early in life, is that the cost model through life, such that someone at, at risk, someone who's at risk, at increased risk, might as a population have a slightly dec slight decrement in the population's longevity of approximately five years over a lowest population. And that the efficacy of primary prevention would be, up, would be about a 30% relative risk reduction for mortality. And then again, there would be this fourfold in independent increased risk associated with coronary calcium. So those are the base case assumptions, keeping in mind they are st a starting point. Using those assumptions, in a lower risk population, you'd get around $90,000 per quality adjusted life you're saved, going from screening to treatment. And this would make it modestly expensive by conventional standards. And the caveat here is many assumptions are made and it applies to a certain population. What I'm going to talk about and I think is important and I want you to take home though, is sensitivity analysis. And I think this is particularly informative. What's the range across these assumptions that changes occur? And so you develop graphs like this, which shows the marginal cost effectiveness for a range of values of a variable. And so what you see here in this green line shows the combined anatomic with risk factor screening cost effectiveness across a range of values, is that if you have a fourfold increased risk for calcium scanning, which is, and here's that base case assumption, at about $90,000 for quality adjusted life you're saved, you've got a moderately expensive test. However, this number is in question. We don't really know the exact incremental value of scanning over risk factor screening. If it's only twofold, and I think some of the Toronto's work says it might just be twofold, then we're upwards in the range between $140,000 and $190,000 per quality adjusted life you're saved not cost effective. If it's very powerful, even fivefold, the cost effectiveness starts getting more and more favorable. So one critical assumption is how good is your test? What's the push? And the push matters. It's not just fighting over whose test is better. It's not just uh, you know, making, trying to get papers published. It really determines the cost effectiveness. How much value, incremental value is there? How many additional people are identified? The next thing to consider is medication costs. If we assume in the base case $300 per year, where the base case gives $90,000 per quality adjusted life you're saved, but if annual cost of additional medications required is only $100, we're in fact at a very 
we're at a cost effectiveness range, keeping all other assumptions frozen. So doing nothing except getting the drugs to cost less, in fact, is an important, can importantly affect quality adjusted life years saved, the cost effectiveness. On the contrary, just make the drug $600 a year. Put them on Plavix instead of aspirin. Okay? And suddenly you've got $150,000 for quality adjusted life years saved. Nothing else has changed. The test has the same effectiveness and so on and so forth. The drugs are just a little more expensive because this goes across many, many, many years of life. Another one, utility. This is a stunner. Okay, remember utility is how valuable is that year of life after the diagnosis. It's not how accurate it's a test. It's what's it do to the person's quality of life. This is our base case, 98%, $90,000 per quality adjusted life you're saved. Once you go below 98%, in fact, the cost effectiveness is dominated by utility. That is that at a, with more than a 2% decrement in quality of life, you can show that it, it, a million dollars per quality adjusted life you're saved because life just isn't worth living anymore. Now that's a gross exaggeration, but you can see that we don't know, have any idea what that number is. And if hypertension is 94%, we better figure out what this number is before we go making any arguments about quality just of life you're saved. Incidental scan findings. We don't really talk about it much. It's a dirty little secret. How common are the incidental findings we get? If it ranges anywhere from 2% to 32%, you can see right around 20% there's an inflection. That if more than one in five people have an incidental scan finding that genders induced costs, we've got a problem. Some populations, older populations, uh, populations from the middle sections of the country where there's a lot of pulmonary nodules, where there's a lot of extra testing, in fact, have very high rates of cost effectiveness uh, of uh, incidental findings. So we have to be mindful of incidental findings and the induced costs from those. And lastly, it's the mortality reduction on medications. The test is only going to make us treat people, and those treatments have to be effective. Otherwise, there's no, no even chance of cost effectiveness. And we assumed a 30% relative risk reduction for mortality. Beneath that, again, it's dominated. And so if we don't have effective therapies, if anything less than a 30% relative risk reduction in terms of mortality for our therapies, in fact, no screening test can be cost effective. So this is a tornado diagram showing you the different uh, important variables and, it's, uh, the, and, and across a range of their values, the, the range of cost effectiveness observed. And it's a useful way to sort of portray the sensitivity of different variables on cost effectiveness within a model. What you see here is efficacy of primary prevention ranging from 50% relative risk reduction to 10% relative risk reduction. Utility of a, uh, medicine with the, with the subclinical diagnosis ranging from 0.99 to 0.95. The predicted value of the test, five-fold increase to two-fold increase. Incidental scan findings, cost of medicines from $100 to $600. And the cost of EBCT ranging from free to $800. Basically, what matters most is these two things here. The predictive value of the test really isn't that strong, doesn't have that strong an influence. Incidental scan findings are not that strong. The cost of medicines, while important, is not that strong. Nor is the cost of the actual test. You can give the test away. It's what happens outside of the test. And if we don't have effective therapies, and if we degrade quality of life too much, it's all for naught. So what our analysis showed was that in a younger screening ho cohort at lower absolute risk, with some fa fairly favorable base case assumptions, it would be about $90,000 for quality adjusted life you're saved to screen with calcium screening. But the marginal cost is dependent on a variety of things. One is the independent incremental predictive power for calcium scanning over Framingham. It's got to be at over fourfold, at least over twofold, or we're not going to get anything out of it. And then medications. We have to have, utility has to be over 0.98. This is not well defined. This should be defined. The efficacy of these treatments has to be strong, and they have to be low cost. So 
health systems, insurers, and society need to understand the cost of new technologies that screen for coronary disease. And what I'm going to leave you with is a thought that cost effectiveness is going to be a partnership between imaging modalities that are accurate and independent. That's where most of us spend our time thinking. But it goes way beyond that. It goes to providers. If providers don't know to use the test and don't treat people to targets, our efforts will be lost. If patients don't adhere to our therapies, all for naught. Health systems have to allow access to tests and therapies. And industry has a big part of this. They have to not only develop effective therapies, but make them inexpensive enough. Otherwise, again, our, our attempts to have cost-effective screening tests are going to be uh, lost. So I appreciate your attention. Uh, hopefully, I've left you with some thoughts on cost-effectiveness you didn't walk in with. We tend to think, oh, the scan costs $200 or $800. But I think it's a lot more than that, isn't it? Thank you very much.